Hello, and welcome to Roll for Resilience, a podcast with the mission to explore how we can use role-playing games like D&D and Final Fantasy as tools to facilitate healing and personal growth. I am your host, a factor of change. My pronouns are he, they. I'm a lifelong gamer and a licensed clinical social worker. On this episode of the podcast, we are discussing the importance of utilizing safety tools while playing tabletop RPGs in order to curate a culture of caring at the table. Join me and our special guests as we dive into the topic, content warning. This episode does contain references to bullying and SI. Welcome to the stream, y'all. Are we live? Yay, Hi, we're, we're live. We There's the live. internet. The whole oh. internet is here. They cannot hear you, though. Hi, ghost. Yeah. They can't hear me. Oh, boo. This is the opposite of what I like. I would rather be heard and not seen. Sometimes my Discord on um, the OBS doesn't link to the correct place. Hold on, OBS having an issue? Hold on, Discord having an issue? What? Never. That's what? never a thing that would happen. All right. Put the two of them together and watch them fight. All right. So, uh, y'all know me. I'm Effector of Change. You can call me AOC. Pronouns are he, they. I am your host for this episode of our podcast. Uh, this is say, episode two of our first season of Roll for Resilience, and we're here to talk about safety tools in tabletop RPGs. So let's go around the room a little bit and introduce yourself. Let us know your name, what are your pronouns, and maybe just a little something about you to get us started. And we'll start at the top with Emmy. Always me first. I love it. Um, so obviously, my name's Emmy. Uh, here on Twitch, I stream mostly JRPGs, spoopy games overall. Anything with a really good meaty story to it. Um, I started playing Dungeons and Dragons probably towards the end of high school, and I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons with Effector for at least 15, 16 years, Effector. I think it's how long we've been playing together in various different groups. I, you know, I've been with groups online, IRL, um, <clears throat> and, uh, I do tend to lean into a more chaotic neutral character type. I, I find myself just drawn to but yeah one of my you know favorite things to do in my free time when i'm not being a workaholic is to play D D. so and it's it's been a great tool as far as helping me socially because growing up i was not a very social person at all had a lot of social issues couldn't talk in groups at all and now there's this it doesn't stop excellent excellent thank you emmy and then i think next in the order is lauren urban right oh Hi, I don't know what the order is, so I will accept whatever you say because you're the dungeon master of this group. Hi, I'm Lauren Urban. <laughs> I am the, my day job is I'm the content manager over at Idol Champions of the Forgotten Realms, which uh, is a D&D &D thing. And then my night job and occasional weekend job is either playing the oboe and orchestras and or playing TTRPGs on stream or on podcasts and things. Mostly D&D, &D, but occasionally other things. Uh, she, her. Most of my characters are a gambit of things. Um, I'm trying to not play as many clerics, but I just play a lot of clerics. It, it happens. Even my bards tend to be clerics. My druid has kind of become a cleric. It, it, all, it all just happens. I guess I'm just a cleric at heart. Um, you can find me over on the Codename Entertainment channel. I've got a website, lauren-urban.com. And uh, you can see me playing on Children of Erte on Tuesdays on the Demiplane RPG channel with the amazing Deborah Ann Wall as our DM. And uh, that's that's the druid who's slowly becoming a cleric. <laughs> it's a great show. It's a great show. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lauren. And uh, all right, we have two Laurens. Lauren, hello. Welcome in. <laughs> Yes. Hello. Uh, my name's Lauren Bryant Monk. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am the co-curator of the TTRPG Safety Toolkit. Um, I am also a safety consultant and game designer. Um, I haven't played D&D in literal years, um, but <laughs> so... Um, but I have been playing a lot of Good Society, and much like uh, other Lauren's characters always turning into clerics, um, my Good Society characters, no matter what role they're given, always become the cornerstone 
um regardless of whether or not they've chosen i've chosen the cornerstone role so sweet sweet and last but certainly not least minimal gameplay hello hello my name is maddie i use they them pronouns um i stream on the twitch and i play mostly games that involve get this minimal gameplay <laughs> so funny um and uh i also play uh over on perception studio which is a um dungeons and dragons and other ttrpgs uh part humans part um puppets um it's super fun and funny and uh in general play for uh comedy and in the times that i play like serious games i it's very it's a struggle so um i i like to uh find everything from the like comedy side of of D, &D um which is super fun i also run tech over there sometimes and i have cats and if they jump up here I also That's, have cat. Yes. Excellent, spectacular. Also have cat. He is in the he's spectacular. In the he made himself right now. He's like a little ball behind. The, the more wall. cats, the better. <laughs> I was just saying, bless you for being a producer. Anyone who runs tech is is uh, amazing in my book because that that's unsung heroes, especially in the TTRPG community. So thank you for for running tech. Also, I will just say you can just call me Obo since we do have two Laurens, and I abdicate the Lauren to the other Lauren because if we're talking about safety tools, you've got nice. you've got Lauren who like literally wrote the book, and then. Obo Lauren, who follows the book that other Lauren wrote. I also have ADHD, and this will explain why I forgot to mention that because we're all talking about characters, my characters, when I play, all have a tendency to turn into, like, surfer stoner dudes that, like, just chill and, like, talk like this and, like, do everything really slow. And, like, I don't, I don't know what it is. They just all turn into that. I love it. Sometimes it's just easier to just, mm. you know, default to... To stoner... <laughs> Yeah. bro the default is always fun and you can never really go wrong with it like, that's true i haven't had a chance to play a character in a while um i know you're sure having. maybe the <laughs> character i played was last in in your campaign uh sisava but i typically go for a bard sisava was fun she was a troll yeah, i love a good bard i love being on the side having utility maybe not so great at the combat but that's okay because i look good that's <laughs> important <laughs> Sava was the shit stir of that campaign. <laughs> our, our topic today is uh, about safety tools in TTRP. Um, and we kind of got a little bit into a little, uh, our experiences. It sounds like we have quite a range of people who've been playing D&D &D a lot, people who've not played D&D &D for a little while, right? So I think it's kind of cool to kind of hear different perspectives. Um, so I guess let's start with Emmy. Emmy, what is the very first TTRPG system you engage with when you played tabletop? And uh, D and D three point five. Sorry, 3 .5. oh, I just... <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so the first TTRPG system that you ever engaged with, and then what is a star? What is a highlight from a recent session you had where you were playing some type of tabletop? Like the main groups I have are the one with you on Wednesdays, and then the one off stream uh, with the other group. Uh, with um i'm trying to think because um in my other group because we've been doing like a an oddball version of vampire the masquerade our dm for that group he tends to take other systems and kind of tweak them into his own set of rules and his set of rules happen to be incredibly fun um it makes murder hoboing very fun for our group, our group is a lot of chaotic people. We're very chaotic. We have somebody who's like the only good neutral person out of all of us who are all chaos. <laughs> the poor guy is stuck trying to wrangle us in all the time. And uh, it just doesn't happen. And I recently became vampire king of all of New York. So I'm very proud of myself after. Hey, mazel tov. Yeah. After, after freeing like this evangelical being that was like i will grant you a wish and i'm like i want to be in charge <laughs> and so i became a vampire prince and then became vampire king i have crowned myself vampire king at this That's point right. uh, but oh, we do have another person in our party where their their stuff is more chaotic than mine and it makes me it makes me laugh every time um plunge 87 is this vampiric clown named patches and patches it, when he's talking every other word is honk honk 
Honk, honk. Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we, get in a, we get in a lot of trouble. And then there's another person who's like a vampire head of a motorcycle gang. <laughs> it gets very interesting. Um, and then in Effector's group, uh, hitting level five is a big thing. And my character nice. is someone who didn't want to come to school. She hates going to school. And now her and her roommates that she didn't really want to be bunked up with, she wanted her own room, uh, are going on a big summer vacation. So, I've you know, there's there's pros to both groups. It's hard to pick one over the other. Yeah, yeah I definitely. Um, so for those uh, who aren't aware, I do run an actual play campaign on my channel. It's called the Frog Pond Academy, where we have a bunch of hijinks. It's more of a slice of life campaign with a few mysteries and heists sprinkled within. Um, because to me, uh, you know, D and D, I feel in its core roots is a war game, right? That's that's where it comes from, you know, from the seventies, and it, it doesn't have to be what we use it as. We can change that up, and so we have races to who's going to take a shower first in the bathroom, and like, how are we going to deal with our roommate drama? And like, we can play out all of these different scenarios through RP. Um, and then there's some combat thrown in, you know, we, we fight giant frogs and mimics and whatever hijinks are on campus, but it's definitely something I love being able to flirt around with is how do we take this system and break it and make it different? Um, so knowing that you had quite a bunch of different systems, you know, you've played at different tables, you've had different DMs, you know, you've been in different groups that I know of, um, what would you say is something that has made a difference for you in terms of being able to really just immerse and enjoy yourself compared to maybe that first time you're playing 3.5? So the first version of 3.5 I played was led by my, my brother and it was all combat, 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 combat. Um, I think you were there for that first session, maybe a factor um, when uh, <clears throat> We were doing that, jeez, it was the first one where we, where I was using Fate for the first time mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, with Mr. Smith as our DM. I, I think that's the best way to refer to him because <laughs> I was trying to think of a name to use for him that's not his real name. Uh, but so the way Mr. Smith worked with this is this was my first time using the system ever and a way to help me step into the system and understand how it's played and really learn my character that I'd created for myself is essentially it's like that that tutorial part of the video game where it's player one and I'm on my own little like 10 minute adventure of myself where I'm being put into the story and that's what he used like as far as you know my my character at the time was known for getting in a lot of trouble she'd start a lot of fights she was part fey and she would go invisible and steal shit like that's the, she was very chaotic and um he used like a one-on-one -on -one combat with somebody who i'd stolen some stuff from it was kind of like the wrong person you know kind of thing i shouldn't have taken that um to kind of teach me how to tweak the system and he's like okay what do you want to do and and that was the first time i'd ever been asked in a game what do i as my character really want to do hmm. And just that that little guide there, the way he did that, kind of redid, like restructured how I thought of D and D and how I played it, and that caused me to connect with each of my characters moving forward more. I don't know if you remember that campaign. I think you were like a, you were some kind of alchemist. I think. Oh, uh, was I in my Roy Roy Mustang uh, era? <laughs> It was the Roy Mustang. Yeah, that was the one before we were the Bledovics. <laughs> and you were and you were like the Russian prince banging Stalin on the side. Yeah, that's true. That is that was a campaign experience, wasn't it? Um sorry. <laughs> similar question for you, Maddie. Like what what was the first TTRPG system you got into and what's a highlight of something you enjoyed about a more recent one? Uh, first would have been also uh, 3.5, um, and some friends were playing, and they invited me, and someone was like, here, make a paladin, and I was like, cool, because I, I played um, EverQuest 2 for a while, so I at least knew 
the base of what a paladin is supposed to kind of be like. Um, so I was like, cool, thank you for picking something I've heard of. Uh, awesome. Um, and so that occurred and uh, nothing ever, it was never finished because, you know, groups of friends, that's kind of how it goes sometimes. Um, some awesome things recently. So one of the things um, at Perception Studio that we do is um, chat can tip to add characters or uh, make like weird twists happen or give um, like GM powers to one of the players for a, a minute. Like it's like a timed minute. Um, and there was one time um, where I was given GM powers and we were at, naturally, I liked what you were saying about doing things other than battling. We were at an underground rave, um, obviously, as Ooh. one does. And we, um, I used, I was like, hmm, I stretched <laughs> uh, what the powers of a bard might be and um, utilized some psychic uh, future sight and um, in a very quick period of time, checked every different tunnel uh, until I found the right one for us to actually be able to leave because we were stuck at the underground rave, again, obviously. Um, and that was super fun. Um, something I like a lot is that we also play a lot of just like one one page TTRPGs. Um, recently, someone suggested a game called Everyone is John or some like white boy name. It was like right, white boy name, right? Okay. Yeah, and I was like, is John. Okay. And I said, really, like, we're going to all be like one part of this person's like brain. And we're deciding that like a guy from the Midwest is what we want to do. We should be a cat instead. And so we played it. Everyone is mittens where we were all <laughs> a cat. Um, <laughs> and it was super fun. And we did things like jump toward like a window and like just generic cat things um which is uh awesome because one cats and two i like being able to do things that aren't necessarily fighting i don't love like fighting i feel like such a focus on dnd in particular is because like the gameplay like mechanic is specifically created around battling but when we use it in everyone is mittens it becomes about am i gonna succeed at stopping myself from eating the food that i'm just gonna throw up like mm -hmm. <laughs> i couldn't by the way <laughs> i failed the role yeah it was lovely yeah we had a, a lovely little foray into a, a two-page tabletop system we played uh goblin with a fat ass that was oh a, gosh like, that was wonderful fun. experience <laughs> <laughs> um at work uh someone put together a, a game night for next month and it's gonna be like normal games um but someone was like we should play D D, and i was like in one night like with people that have never played yeah sure um, so instead i'm gonna run a game of lasers and feelings i don't know if anyone's played lasers and feelings um, it's super fun and simple, and you roll d6s to see if things happen, and it's just, uh, a good, a good beginner system for, That sounds um, similar to Fate, where you used four d6s and got bonus d6s, I think. Fate? Find anything with a d6 is nice and simple. <laughs> um, we're playing a yeah. game of Fate next month on Tuesday nights, and I just kind of figured out my character, but it's gonna be based in, like, um, Greek mythology, like god, demigod kind of world, and uh, I'm very excited about that, because I usually play uh, there, like, once a month uh, for studio day, but doing, like, a weekly show for a minute will be really fun. Plus, Fate is a cool system. It is. I found, yeah. like, using it, it's really... It's easy. super accessible so, like, we'll too. Play with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, guys, we'll go to Obo since uh, since you've redacted your first name, Obo. Redacted. It's gone. It's gone forever. Uh, Lauren, how about you? What was your first TTRPG system, and what's a highlight from a, a recent game you enjoyed? So I was thinking about this. I, most of my experience when I was real young was either playing video game RPGs. Or I had these these kind of bespoke moments of like helping out with a, a game here and there. And the only one that 
when I was young, uh, <laughs> when I was in college, I went to college as a performance major, and the vast majority of the people in my dorm one year would get together on Saturday nights and take over the lounge, and they would play a Star Wars TTRPG. I don't remember which one. I don't know if I ever actually looked at the rule book or anything. Now, Saturday nights are, they're a time in where I usually have concerts. Uh, they're, they're big concert night. And so my Saturdays were often, I was up until about 11 doing a gig, and then I'd go grab food and go back to the dorm. And this group would have been playing for like three or four hours, and they would play until like nine o'clock the next morning. Um... But a lot of them were my friends, and I like Star Wars. And so I would often go in with my food and just kind of sit in a corner and watch. And more than once, the person running the game, storyteller, whatever the, the system was, would be like, hey, can you just be this person for a moment? Can you just play this? Uh, so I had a lot of fun playing a Star Wars system that I, I still to this day have no idea what I was doing or if I was doing it right, but it was fun. But my first real experience with tabletop was fourth edition. Um, I was in the process of moving out to Seattle and I had been listening to the Acquisitions Incorporated um, podcasts back in my day when they were just audio podcasts and got real excited and I'd always wanted to play D&D but never had the chance. And so when I got out to Seattle, one of the things I did was found um, a game that was happening at a store because they would do, um, I don't remember what, exactly what they called them, but it was like you showed up and everybody who showed up on one night would get split into groups and you go play D&D &D and it was organized to play. Adventure League? Adventure League, yes. Um, and so that was kind of my first real experience with like, uh, and I say real as in like, I had a character sheet and I knew the rules and that was a lot of fun. And that group played for years, uh, even after, unfortunately the store closed, we all then just migrated to my apartment. Um, I, I ran a campaign for them. They ran games for me. It was, it was super fun. Um, and yeah, since then, just been playing a lot, either uh, my own home games or just gotten into this whole streaming thing and a little bit of podcasting. I I do play mostly D and D, and what I do love about the system is the flexibility of it, uh, like you all have been talking about, and. Like I do, and I also kind of enjoy that you can lean into one of the different pillars of it. Um, so like I do enjoy combat, uh, but I, I kind of want the combat and the exploration and the role play to all be a nice balance point. But if you if you ask me what my favorite moments are, uh, which was your other question of like, what's a recent favorite moment? They're all not just role playing, but specifically, character interaction, whether it's player, 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 DM, whatever it is, an actual character interaction that has consequences, I guess, would be the way to put it. Like <laughs> Consequences that... are fun. Consequences are fun. Yes. But like not just idle chatter, but like talking about something that's going on in those characters' lives, having good meaty conversations. And that's kind of that's where all of the the joy really comes out for me is in those moments or when I'm a DM, when I can facilitate those moments happening. Because I feel like when when the characters get a chance to really interact and have things that they want to talk about with the other characters, that's a sign that everybody's having fun and it's a good story um, because that's that's just my jam. Um and I did have that moment very recently. We, Children of Verte has been uh, doing pre-recorded shows. Spoiler alert, which is not really spoiler. Um, and so we recorded an episode recently, which as of this moment hasn't aired yet. So when it happens, uh, if you're listening to this podcast and you're like, Lauren, was that the moment you were talking about? You can come to me. Um, <laughs> but I had this amazing conversation my character with Alicia Marie's character uh on Children of Verte that was 
I don't know how long it was. You know, you get into those kind of intense moments and it feels like it took five seconds and then someone's like, oh yeah, the two of you were talking for 20 minutes. So I don't remember exactly how long it was, but it was it was a really beautiful moment of these two characters kind of reconciling everything that had happened to them and the potential of the future and a kind of battling with a question that the both of them were, knew they were going to have to answer for themselves. And it just, it felt real, it just felt real good. Mm -hmm. Even though not everything about the conversation was happy, some of it was sad, some of it was angry, some of it was uh, being scared of something that was going to probably happen. But that kind of like connection with another person, even if it's two characters that we're playing at that moment, is is just so special that that's why I keep coming back to any tables, whether it's D&D or some other system. Yeah, I, I think that it's a unique platform, a TTRPG, where you could embody the headspace of another person. Maybe Maybe they're not human, but whatever, another person. And just really feel that and connect with that and connect with another person's character that they've created. It's a whole new world, you know, compared to what we can sometimes do. I um, attended PAX uh, Unplugged in 22 and got to go to all sorts of cute little panels and hear people talk about things. That's when I first really learned about uh, safety tools and like what people are using them for. And I was so uh, touch you know most of the people that were sitting in those panels wanting to curate a healthy positive role play experience were librarians because that's where our queer kids are going they're going to the library and they're playing D D, and that's how they're being able to explore things and you know in an environment that feels safe and supportive and so these dedicated librarians are like we need to learn this we gotta figure this out because of our teens let's go um that's but awesome it, it does speak to what this genre can do what potential it has on the other side we also have to think about what dangers does that create you know if we're not careful um thank you for sharing that little moment with us Thank you. And and I definitely, once everybody's gone around the horn, I can speak a lot to like times in my life that I wish I had more uh, official safety tools to fall back on that, you know, knowing what I know now mm -hmm. about how I would have handled other situations or had more tools. So and Lauren, can you share with us uh, one of your first TTRPG systems and, you know, something you enjoyed at a more recent time? Yeah, I mean, Lauren's story actually made me rethink what my first uh, TTRPG was also, because um, I would have said 3.5, that was the first one I, you know, official TTRPG I played. Um, oddly enough, in the attic of my church as an official uh, youth group event, not usually the uh, <laughs> association with religion that people have with D&D, &D. Um, but, you know sometimes people are cool <laughs> um but actually if i really think about it uh i was maybe a, a few years before that i was at summer camp and it was like the last day of summer camp and you, you know like the camp friends you have that you just like sort of hang out with and he had seen somebody play Dungeons and Dragons, I guess, um, in his life and decided he wanted to make his own version of it, you know, the way that you do when you were a kid. So he brought like three different board games and like pieced them together and like <laughs> walked us through a little story. Um, so I, I think that's technically my first TTRPG um, was this was this kid just you know trying to trying to make a game out of three board games he had? Did he include Pretty Princess? Because I think that was actually everyone's pretty, pretty first princesses. TTRPG. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, I don't think he did. Okay, I don't. I don't think I've even ever played Pretty Princess. Mm -hmm. I was. I asked yeah, for it for years no. for Christmas and never got it, and I was disappointed every year as a kid. 
nightmare. The first real of published game. It's because the other game was real. It just wasn't published. Uh, the first published uh, game I played was was 3.5. Um, I didn't, it didn't really take off for me. I enjoyed it, but I just never really got into it until um, probably right after I finished my master's degree um, and I and I got into Adventurers League at in the basement of a comic book store. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, went went on from there <laughs> um but something that i really love that happened in a game recently and now i have to admit it's been a while so i've been very busy so it's been a while since i've had some some time to get in a good game but i play on <laughs> uh, I, I feel a little bit like the obnoxious indie kid in this in this circle because <laughs> um just because it's been so long since i played D D, but um I've been playing a lot of good society is can be GM'd, but mostly I play it. Uh, my friends and I, we play it GM less. Um, and one of the things that I love about GM less games in particular, um, and, uh, the, and, and yeah, GM less, sorry. One thing I love about GM, GM less games in particular is that, uh, you can all sort of work together to come up with, a story and sometimes it's really weird and goes places you can never imagine but like the sort of writer's room style talk of like okay how do we go from here to there and how do we make that happen um and when you can when you get a good group of people who are all really invested in like um just trying to figure out especially near the end of a, a, a campaign, like how to land the plane of your story all together is, is really fun and something that I always find really rewarding. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's a unique journey. I've often thought as I've reflected back on my notes from my sessions, I'm like, I would have never written the plot this way. Uh, and here we are <laughs> because we've got <laughs> all the other human beings that are working with me as, you know, I'm the GM, but it's our story. We're telling it together and it's their characters and they're just reacting as they would. Um, it's or you set up like a huge story and the characters just go right around it. Don't even interact. Yeah. Or like a random detail that you didn't think was a thing, suddenly they fixate on. And so now that becomes now a focal point of the campaign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I was being called out here on this show, but here I am. <laughs> but, yep, I've been on both sides of that. That, um, whoops, you, I've become fixated on this thing and then find out later that wasn't supposed to be a thing. And, and then also been the GM where my players got fixated on a thing. And I'm like, well, I can either just make this work or I'm making it work because it's, it's, it's group storytelling and they really like this gnome. So here we go. Everybody likes a gnome. Yeah. One particular element mm -hmm. that went off the rails is uh, someone wanted me to come up with books that they're finding in the library. And so, you know, Oh God, <laughs> you do the thing where you find fantasy novel titles. And now we have a whole collection of fantasy smut in our world that takes you to other planes and causes all sorts of mayhem all because they thought that was interesting. I'm like, okay, we'll go with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. There's so many campaigns where that's happened. I want to say with your uh, game of Thrones one years ago, I'm pretty oh. sure there were a couple. <laughs> we went way off the rails. Yeah, you did. I, I remember a specific thing that turned into a whole, a uh, literal shit throwing fiesta or fight mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. As one yep. does in, in Westeros. I guess we'll circle up to, up to Lauren Urban. You were talking about some stuff that was coming up for you that you're resonating with about your TTRPG experience. Um, where you were like, man, if only I had a tool or multiple tools, this, this could have changed uh, this experience for me. Can you share a little more uh, about what you were thinking there? So back in my fourth edition days, um, the group of us had, we rotated DMs and session zero to me, like, I don't think that that term had been coined yet, but the idea of like 
okay, we're all going to get together and have pizza and make characters and decide on what we're going to do for a campaign was kind of a thing. And so I, this is, it's a weird book ended story, beginning of the campaign, end of the campaign, beginning of the campaign, uh, because of an idle comment that I had made when I was a player, I found myself running a game for uh, evil characters, uh, an entire party of evil characters. And so unintentionally, we ended up having what I would now consider to be like a safety tools talk-ish, mostly about like, okay, here's our parameters for evil. Here are things that we're just not going to do no matter how evil. Here's things that I'm not going to ask you all to do, that kind of thing. And at the time, I never, I, I don't think I had thought to do that for all campaigns. This was mostly like, oh, we're running evil, so we should probably be careful. Lawful evil and blah, blah, blah. Go through the campaign. And we're literally at the end. They're about to go walking through the door into the room where the BBEG was. And there was a, an encounter that was supposed to just kind of be a warm up, maybe burn a little bit of resource encounter and also give them some hints about what was going to be in that big final room. And <laughs> I, we were all, we had no money. There's no minis, there's no nothing. Uh, but I printed out little, um, uh, basically on paper, just like the, the monsters I was using and then tape them to a D6. And that's the monsters I was using. So we get into this antechamber and I pull out the creatures and they were giant spiders. I start putting the giant spiders down. And immediately, like three of my players, like, nope, 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 nope. And it took me a hot second to realize it wasn't the fun nope. It wasn't, it wasn't the, oh no, nope. No, these, this is serious nope. These are people who are just absolutely about to leave the table nope. And it took me a longer, I look back on it now and I'm kind of embarrassed how long it took for me to like rejigger and fix things at the time because like I didn't I hadn't really realized that kind of thing despite the fact that we'd even talked at the beginning and essentially had that that lines and veils about evil but it never had occurred to me to go through anything that might be in the campaign it was the first time I dropped giant spiders and three of my my players literally like got up from the table and so real quick it was just like ah they're not giant spiders they're giant Bunnies, sure, bunnies. I just started taking the, the paper off and we kind of reset everything and then they just became bunnies and things were better. But like, that's the moment that I think back on when the safety tools discussions became something that was prevalent and learning how to, how to think about those kind of things from the beginning as like, oh, if I had had those in this moment, especially like I should have thought about that considering we even thought about it at the beginning of the campaign. We knew enough to be like, these are evil characters. So we have to have some boundaries to keep these people, these uh, characters together. And that, oh, I wish I just expanded that to be like the entire world of D and D and why hadn't I? And so now it's a lot easier both uh, to avoid things like the giant spiders and just not worry about that because we've had that talk at the beginning. And then if something comes up in the middle of a game, that's unexpected, I now have the tools to, to deal with it in a much quicker way and not fumble through turning spiders into bunnies. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's the moment I think of whenever people are just like, but I don't know if the safety tools are really necessary. And I'm like, let me tell you, <laughs> let me tell you about my all evil campaign that we're afraid of spiders. Let's go. Well, I'm sure there's a specific group of Monty Python fans that would be afraid of the bunnies equally as the spiders. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, I think that that rabbit from the movie is probably what came to mind in my, in my panic to like fix things, but not run, you know, ruin the game to basically, you know, in, terms we would now use uh s several people hit a line that i didn't know about and i 
responded eventually in the way that was necessary uh, by just removing and replacing and then making sure everybody was okay. But yeah, at the at the time it was panic inducing. Mm-hmm. It's like I didn't because I didn't want to. I didn't want my friends to be upset. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm sure Lauren, you can speak more about this as well, given, you know, your deep experiences doing consulting on safety. Um, But as a psychotherapist, we're all about informed consent, right? Like, you know, from the beginning, somebody even looks at my website to the point where they're walking out the door for the last time. We are constantly thinking about what's going on there. How are we doing things? Um, I've had consultations with my mentor about my website in particular. So I do what's called EMDR therapy. So I do a lot of work with complex trauma, PTSD, managing things, helping people work through that. And so when I first drafted my website and I presented it to her, she was like, no, you need to change this. Like, why? What's what's wrong with it? She's like, it's too much exposure. You're putting way too much that is going to trigger somebody, not everybody, but at least one person's going to read this copy. And n- no, that's not great. That's not great. And so I, with her help, definitely reconstructed my website. Um, and there's a lot of practices that I've developed and continue to tinker in my practice to make sure that I'm doing what I can to pre- practice informed consent. Um but I think it's the same thing here when we're talking about a, a role play, whether it's a one shot or a long campaign, right? We want to be able to establish a sense of informed consent with each other in the group. Uh, Lauren, would you mind sharing a little bit about um, maybe where the beginnings of the toolkit started? Yeah. So my uh, first exposure to safety tools um was um watching uh somebody do a a monster hearts 2 actual play um and i remember being i remember talking to uh somebody who was a friend of mine who was in it um and going like i don't think i could do this like how are you how are you managing this and um they were able to explain basically they didn't call it lines and veils because you know the those are just words that we use but you know talking about hard and soft nose mm-hmm. um and and just uh that sort of opened the idea for me and from there i started learning about other things i started learning about the history um i started sort of collecting my own little um google drive of resources uh um as i learned about about more uh safety tools um and uh the <laughs> the way the toolkit itself was sort of born was actually because my co-curator and i uh Kiana were doing a panel at my uh local gaming convention um and we had been told that there was going to be AV, um, but then there wasn't <laughs> going to be AV. Um, and so we wanted to have some sort of uh, uh, some sort of like thing to give people to explain what's going on. And Kiana at the time had made a, a one page safety tool explainer uh, for actual play. Um, and we decided then that we could tweak that uh, their explainer, add it to my Google Drive of tools um, so that we could have handouts and links for this panel. Uh, and then also we we just we knew it was going to be useful for a lot of people. So we released it to everything else. But it, it really um it really just came from a desire to collect things that i had been seeing kind of going on um you know thrown around uh the thing about the tabletop space and about it being so online um is that a lot of things kind of the internet is very ephemeral right so um lines and veils is 
from my knowledge, the oldest like official safety tool that we're using um, in the form that it was made. It was it's about 20 years old um, and it came from the forge uh, by and it was developed by Ron Edwards. But the forge is gone um, <laughs> for anybody who who doesn't know. The forge was a, a forum for uh, game designers and people who like um, uh, role playing games. Um, and you know, but it was a forum and forums are dead now and um so well they're not dead but you know um so so all of this stuff you know we were trying to do internet archaeology or when google plus shut down there was a huge section of um people who played and talked about ttrpgs on google plus and had all of their all of this stuff on google plus and and when google plus finally shut down there was a big desire to kind of keep and collect and preserve things that were going away. And so um, we started really looking at uh, the toolkit as a way to, first of all, have everything in one place so that people didn't have to do all of the Googling themselves, um, didn't have to, you know, try and find things, um, but also so that we could uh, contribute to the preservation of uh, things that may or may not, you know, be there. And I don't know, maybe one day Google Drive will shut down and I'll have to find some other place to put it. But for now, let's hope um, Google Drive doesn't shut down anytime soon. <laughs> no, no, you just you just made a pit in my stomach. I'm like, sorry. All of my notes. Oh, no. <laughs> I know. I know. But well, this is the this is the thing. This is why curation is is important you know is is that so so that we always have things and that's why we're you know we have a website now so there's other there's other ways to share the same information but um yeah it was just it was a thing that i was interested in and wanted to talk about and needed to find an easy way to share it around with people and uh you know kiana and i are both really grateful that it's resonated with so many people and that so many people use it um, you know, I I see on your uh on your chat that you use Bbars's full deck method, which is really cool because that's one that uh not a lot of people sort of know or use, um, but I think is really neat. Um I'm just a nerd who likes to talk about this. Yeah, stuff. well, I'm a nerd who also loves to talk about this stuff, hence <laughs> the uh email and the invite <laughs> to have you come on. Um, and I'm a nerd that's grateful that you put in the work to talk about this. Yeah, I have a lot of uh, I have a lot of friends on the Twitch world who who stream and, and do their things, but tabletop for a lot of them is new or unfamiliar territory, or it seems shiny, but I'm scared. Uh, and I think like being able to break down a little bit of like you don't have to be scared. Like there are ways that we can have a safe experience and figure this out together. Um, and looking at a blank character sheet for the first time, I will not lie has always been terrifying. And I think it's intimidating to new players. And I, I want to commend like the work that you were both doing to curate and keep this out there. I'm seeing other developers are now starting to build that stuff right into their things. I have a copy of, um, Thirsty Sword Lesbians? Have you guys seen Thirsty Sword Lesbians? <laughs> and there's like an anti-bigotry page right in the front of the book. There's stuff in here about some safety right at the beginning, safety and consent. There's a whole segment right before you get into the game. And so just knowing that, you know, people are hearing, you know, about these things and wanting to implement that right in the core of their system, I think is fantastic. Leave um, it to the queer people to put that first. <laughs> I can think of many different <laughs> campaigns I've been a part of where having the safety tools like the safety tool deck or even just like a factor before we did Frog Pond Academy, he had us do a survey where having mm -hmm. something like that in place, I think, would have made the game very enjoyable because some of those games wound up in the end turning extremely bad <laughs> and being able to like have had a safety tool at the time for those looking back on them would have been very beneficial and i think would have made it so the the group would have likely stayed together i think if if everybody had that kind of open communication and i don't yeah. know if i would have ever played any type of horror rpg 
if it wasn't for the fact that that kind of thing exists and it is starting to get baked in even in there. Um, I played, I did a, a, it was a six episode show based on the midnight world, which is a, a newer uh, thing call a Cthulhu without the Cthulhu. Um, and definitely has a lot of, uh, a lot of things right into the game that the two game designers, it was intentional. Like this is, these are uh, characters that you're going to play. They're going to deal with issues like PTSD. They're going to deal with this. And so there's a whole section right at the front of the book. That's not just here's a whole bunch of safety tools so that you all know about the things that you are okay with dealing with and things you're not, but like, here's also how to approach some of these topics in a respectful manner. Here's ways that you can avoid the tropes that come up with things like being scared or frightened or having uh, PTSD. And it's it's a it's the kind of thing in where special it's important for any game, but especially in a horror game where those it can feel like, well, but you've signed up for a, a horror game. Of course, you're supposed to get horrified. And it's like, no. I signed up for a haunted house. I, I, that's what I want, but I want to be able to walk out the other side and be okay. And so I don't know if I ever would have even trusted trying some of those if it wasn't for the fact that by the time I got a chance to play Vampire and got a chance to play Midnight World and Call of Cthulhu and all of those, safety tools had become a thing that was just a standard. Horror games are really interesting. Um from a sort of and and often where safety tools come up a bit with about as much frequency as like a game like monster hearts where there's like something sexual or you know a sexual or romantic element um but horror games in particular are very interesting to me because you are playing both to scare the character like to make the character feel scared but also to make you the player feel scared so if you're playing like you know uh a a D and D something might happen that, you know, is, is very scary to a character or, um, causes a, a strong reaction, like anger or something to the character you're playing and you can role play that, but you might not actually be angry yourself. Um, or it's less likely to be angry yourself. Um, but with horror, the goal is to scare you the player like there's there's this meta layer of fear on top of the character layer of fear and um this is where we get into uh you know the idea of bleed like horror games are meant to have this sort of like bleed out of feeling from the game into the real life um and so it yeah it makes a lot of sense that um horror games and and i think I mean, I'm not I'm not a huge into horror games, but I wouldn't be surprised if, um, you know, horror games were were do, you know, writing in safety tools or or what we would now call safety tools, mechanics and 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 even just reminders and rule books long before some of the other um, uh, tabletop games were just because, yeah, you are supposed to you you the player are also supposed to be scared um and and you have to embody the fear in a way that you don't necessarily have to do in tabletop yeah, i think the system that i use that really produced that like irl feeling of like what your character should be feeling is called dread i don't know if anyone oh gosh that one. Dread. Oh yeah See, I have not figured out how to replicate it online but in person you have a jenga tower and if you want to do something, you just do it. But if you want to do something that requires some challenge, you have to pull from the tower. And so it starts out very, you know, you're just a bunch of friends playing Jenga, no big deal. But as that tower mm -hmm. begins to get wonky, you know, if that tower falls, you're gone. Um, and so it just Jenga is an absolute it. panic attack waiting to happen. I hate that game. <laughs> it's very effective at Jenga. Yes. <laughs> The yeah. one time I played it, a factor was the DM for it. It was like our Halloween thing, I think, that year. And I I remember like just just shaking the whole time at like the last bit of the game, trying to like get this piece onto the top. I, I knocked it over and I wound up being consumed by a whole bunch of these creepy dolls. 
I recall correctly. I think so. Uh, But had I made one choice different that wouldn't have made me pull, I would have survived. But I was definitely at that moment feeling what my character was feeling. And of course, using the Jenga tower to play to, as a way to tell that story is, you know, it's, it's you're physically being affected by the feelings that your character is feeling. And so it does challenge you a bit like Mr. Smith, who is a part of that group. He was able to stay level the whole time, except for at one point, I think he just like knocked the tower over, if I recall correctly, and let himself death. die. Yeah. Yep. He, he went with a heroic death. Whereas mm-hmm. I was like, no, I can survive. I was going to say that reminds me of another, it's not as much horror as it is almost like dread. 10 candles is another mm-hmm. really good example mm-hmm. of that. And definitely uh, has baked into it safety tools, if only because when you are signing up for the game, you're signing up for your character to be dead by the end of it and for everybody to essentially fail. You're signing up for the end of the world. And even knowing that and knowing that like the purpose of this is not to, the the winning is not in the saving the world. The winning is in telling this intense emotional story uh, of your character and the group that you're with. And it's, it can be really emotional, despite the fact that you know from the beginning that this character is not going to survive the night. And despite the fact that you get to those points where you're like, oh, this is, this is it. This is my chance to do the thing. And I'm probably going to have to, you know, blow out a candle at this point. And just the way the game holds everything together and builds that kind of tension is phenomenal. And yeah, it's, it's, you end up doing a lot of of crying, even though it's like, but none of this was real and also i knew it was going to be a tragedy from the beginning but it doesn't matter because those emotions are super real i really like 10 candles um it's like my favorite way of broaching character death i'm not a big fan of character death in in a lot of games but uh 10 candles um you're basically like you're consenting to die by playing the game in the same way that like in dread you're consenting to play jenga you know so if that's a problem you know so maddie probably won't play dread because maddie doesn't like jenga i won't be playing any of these horror games (laughs) just throwing that out there but Um, listen that's fair and and to be honest as much as i've been playing a lot more in the last couple of years I really find for me personally, it's short. I don't think I could play like weeks and weeks and weeks of a whole campaign. Really, it's like, mm-hmm. here we go. I'm going to do an episode. I'm going to do like six sessions. I'm going to do a, a very contained kind of thing because I, that's, it's my jam in very small increments. And I think yeah. it's, it's because of that buildup of emotions. Yeah. We played a game called Magical Kitties Save the World. That was pretty scary. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, so good. But it sounds magical. Yeah. Well, it is, but we 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 met. Um, who's the lady that uh, boils the two kids into food? Come oh, on. the witch from Hansel and Gretel. That's yeah. the one. You no, know, we met her. So it's very terrifying. Ooh, <laughs> maybe not as scary as Jenga, but no, that sounds pretty <laughs> scary enough. I would rather not be boiled into soup. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yes. It is interesting to me that the other. I mean, the Wretched and Alone games use a Jenga tower also, I believe. Um, There are a bunch of solo games. But the other big Jenga game that I know is StarCrossed, um, actually, which is a a two-player game. Uh, It's a two-player romance game about um, two people who really want to but really can't is is the pitch. Um, And so the way you play is you have this Jenga tower and um, every time you make an action, you have to do a pull. Mm. Um, And every time you talk, you're supposed to touch the tower while you're talking um, and then take the tower off. And the tower represents your resolve to not act on your feelings. So as soon as the tower falls, um, you have to act on your feelings. Uh, And it's a great, 
uh it's a great way to experience the tension of um of attraction uh and forbidden attraction and and basically uh you are the 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 longer you keep the tower going the more successful your relationship is going to end up um you know the the better a chance it is of being not just a moment of passion the slower the burn the better the fire <laughs> yeah basically um it's a real yeah, it's very good they just they just recently uh alex roberts just finished um crowdfunding uh sort of like um not really second edition but just extra stuff uh love letters is is what it's called but anyway star crossed there's a um gay love letters yeah yeah i have that one um anything gay anything send it to me <laughs> unless it's horror yeah i mean hmm. i mean star crossed is pretty is pretty gay to begin with i i, I feel I like mean, <laughs> but uh um, you can make anything gay if you try hard enough it's true yeah uh, and sometimes you don't have to try very hard it's funny to think about that because whenever I've thought about sitting at a table where there was like no safety tools or 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 any mindfulness of that, and then the tables were like it's like baked right into everything you do, it's usually been a queer table or a not queer table for me. It's the gaze. Oh, it's just a personal anecdote. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've had that experience as well. Also, and and I say this as an old younger people are are more likely to be not just conversant and on board, but expectant. Like they've now essentially grown up with the idea of safety tools as part of a TTRPG, even even in basic forms, even in just real simple, uh, you know, the X and O, and here we go. But but yeah. It's newer people into TTRPGs are learning the stuff that I wish I had known about when I got into TTRPGs. And it's great. Yeah. And and this is one of the things is like, you know, that stuff was probably around when you when you first got in, but it was just harder to find. And it was such a boon that we yeah. have, you know, the internet in which we can disseminate and learn this information. Um, because a lot of a lot of these safety tools, like um, you know, we talked about the lines of veils that came from a from a forum, but things like the X card by John Stavropoulos um, came out of convention play. Mm. Uh, you know, so it, if if you didn't get a chance to go to a convention where you know they were using the X card, maybe you did, and and you didn't bring that X card back to your comic shop basement, then you don't get to you don't get to know about it. So it's. Um, it's really, yeah, it's just, it's really cool that uh, we are able to, you know, spread this information in the way that we are. Um, I feel like there is also, uh, especially in queer communities um, and marginalized communities, there's just a, a better sense of the importance of boundaries because... Mm -hmm. Um, the way I describe the way I describe safety tools to people who have never heard of them or maybe a little bit unsure as to why you need them is that you're basically setting up boundaries, um, you know, before the game and, and then enforcing boundaries after the or like during the game. So like um, with Lauren's example about the spiders, uh, you know. <laughs> that was a boundary that those players set they said i don't like spiders and i'm not going to continue to play the game if we have these spiders and um uh lauren was was good enough to like see that that was happening and said okay let's fit like i'm going to respect that and change it so that we can still all have a good time and i think in um in people like so, i i find people with more privilege are often less like they they're less likely to have their boundaries transgressed or they're less likely to be talking about boundaries or just accepting that boundaries will be transgressed um you know i think this is definitely a thing with uh people who are are femme or women in spaces where they're just sort of used to not saying anything when their boundaries are stepped over um 
uh, because that's the way that they were, uh, that's the way that they were socialized. And, um, you know, when you have a history of tabletop, which is like these old white men who are, you know, uh, like Gary Gygax was famously a combative GM who really wanted, really felt like he was fighting against his players, then you are just going to want to, you're, you're, you're going to want to step on toes um, by design. And as, as players, we have, you know, decided that that's not what we want anymore. Or if we want it, we want it in very specific situations. Um, and in very specific ways. Uh, and also we just like hang out with LARPers now uh, because yeah. a lot of these, a lot of these tools originated in LARP because mm -hmm. they, it, when you're embodying the character, you need those protections a lot. Yeah. Cause more. somebody can get hurt. Like, yeah. 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 Um, and, and I think that, you know, like, what what in tabletop uh, i think in the fourth edition rule book they would call like the actor uh stance um or, or yeah the fourth edition dungeon master's guide which has a great play page on player styles that i still refer to <laughs> um but uh you know that wasn't always the case and and that wasn't the expectation for a lot of times, especially if we're talking about games that come from a D&D &D lineage, because they come from a war game lineage, which comes from playing on battles that already happened. We already know, you know, how they're going to end necessarily. We already have our feelings all sorted out. So it's um, it's been really great to see as a society, we've become more emotionally intelligent um, and more used to talking about it um and and i think queerness is definitely like a great vector because when you reject you know the gendered notions of how we're supposed to deal with strong emotions or things happening to us um then it opens up so much more space for discussion the comment i want to make about we were talking about the experience of bleed where the experiences of your character are are felt by the human being the player right bleed also happens the other way where your personal experience can be infused in your character i can't think of a single tabletop character i created <laughs> that wasn't trying to deal with something that I'm trying to work through myself. I just don't always tell people, you know, I've, I've used tabletop characters to play around with gender. I've used tabletop characters to work on mommy issues. I've used tabletop characters to deal with uh, my physical looks. Right. And like my insecurities around that. And, the character becomes a vector to be able to play out these different roles and these different things. And I think we need to be able to honor that element of it as well and create as, as comfy as a space as we can so that people aren't hurt in, I guess it's not a physical, you know, there's no way to throw any fireballs at you, but you know, hurt in the other sense, you know, where, where that really affects you. Um, and I think not, not just intentional, putting something into a character that I'm trying out, but I've also had the experience of not realizing that my character was doing something that I needed to work out until all of a sudden it was either pointed out to me mm -hmm. or I realized it's like, oh, yeah, that is a thing that I'm dealing with right now, isn't it? And and so those those safety tools mean that if that happens, I'm less likely to be upset when it happens because I've been having a... a I've been having an experience that I know that I'm inherently going to enjoy, even when I have those weird realizations, you know, TTRPGs aren't therapy, but they have those moments of their <laughs> being therapeutic. So yeah, I, there is therapeutic tabletop out there. Just, oh yeah. Say I am, but I'm not a therapist. <laughs> yeah. And but I, yeah. And, yeah. And I think it's important. Um, 
that, and I'm not saying any of y'all are doing this, but I do think it's important that we talk about, because people do talk about tabletop as therapy, is that unless you are doing tabletop with your therapist, you should not, that should not be your um, intention. Yeah. Um, and as much as I've like, I and I, I think every queer <laughs> tabletop player has like used used uh, a tabletop character to explore queerness like I feel like that's just one of the the universal experiences of being queer and liking tabletop games um but you know I think I think it's important um to to realize and and this is why table it's great because you can just stop you can just decide hey this is too much for me or, hey, this is getting too real. Or, hey, I don't like those pronouns after all, so I would rather we don't use them for this character. You can just change it, and it's all fine. Like, it's it's all... Um, it's all not... Uh, you know, it's all not real. <laughs> Maddie has... I, just, I think there's something also to be said about... Something I, like what you guys are all talking about, like I get absolutely, and I think that's the norm, but I, I feel that often I purposely do it different. I also have a very different queer experience than anyone that I've ever met in that I was super young and I was just like, it never occurred to me that I sh like it, that it was something that people might not like. And then I never told anyone and my mom one day was just like, hey, I think you're dating that Amanda girl. And I was like, what? Ha <laughs> ha. And like never talked about it, like nothing ever. It's just always been like completely natural in my life, which has been great. Um, but it also it's not something I've had to uh, work through because it always just made sense to me. There was nothing that I needed to like work through. Um, but something that I do, uh, rather opposite, I, I kind of like playing really like straight white, like privileged men. Um, I played it. I made a character named, I named him cash and the S was a money sign. Like, oh, no. yeah, like, li like that's because you know what? It's something I'm never going to experience. There's nothing I can do in the world to ever experience being a cisgender, straight white male. Like that's just impossible for me. And they certainly have an experience that I, I, I don't know, like, cool. Like, and I can just do stuff and no one questions anything. And I'm just like, yo, my butler's here. Gotta go. You know? And everyone's like, oh, cool, your butler? Neat. You know? And then, like, the butler's in on the crime. That was for, like, a Clue-themed D&D um, one-shot, which was super fun. But um, I try to play queer characters, and like I said, they all become, like, just stoners. I don't know. I'm just... Uh, I Maybe I'm trying to, like, be less gay in the world because it's not something I've experienced. I mean, that makes me think of this character I had in the campaign I ran where, uh, I don't know if you know the Bulba boy, uh, Bulba played as, like, essentially his IRL oh, yes. uncle. Uh, he, he spelled it, the name was Gareg, G-A-R-E-G-G, -G, Gareg. Isn't that Greg, how it's spelled? It spelled Greg, yeah. Greg was Greg. he was he was homophobic racist. <laughs> he was he was he was everything in you know those old misogynistic white yeah. men we love to hate. And mm -hmm. and he used that as a way, I think, to work through the issues with this person that he was mimicking. Sure. <laughs> and then eventually we had a character come in who was a person of color, and there was like this moment of where this shaman essentially helped Gareg work through his issues of racism and homophobiaism. And he wound up making love with this gorgeous, beautiful, big booby black goddess and she is moon goddess. And she was like, became the love of his life. So the way his story ended up is he, Gareg was, was a misogynist, racist, homophobic bastard no longer. Um, he realized the error of his ways and, and it was a really great way to that Holden and the other person worked through it. And that's also and, playing out like a, like a fantasy world that like we know isn't going to happen. Yeah. The people like online that we, you know, try to say, Hey, you're wrong. And here's why. And we know they're not ever going to like, nothing we say is going to change their mind. 
Yeah. But Rylich's I just, heart grew three ch- sizes this day. And it's like, yes, <laughs> yes, I want that game because that doesn't happen. Oh, um, it was it was a beautiful moment. And I think I was dying the whole time they were acting it out. Because unfortunately <laughs> they did act out. But super quick, how do you spell homophobia ism? Is it like I is it like it sounds? I would think so. Okay. Homophobia ism. So like I A I. At the yeah. end there? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was, think... that was, it was a highlight for me in that set, in that campaign overall was seeing something like that happen. Yeah, I was just, I wanted to uh, draw your attention to, um, and it's something I've been meaning to put in the toolkit, but uh, Janaya Kemper, um, who is a, a LARP scholar and game designer, um, has done a lot of work on, uh, a concept they call uh, emancipatory bleed. Um, And that is sort of like, and, and there's many ways to, to approach it, you know, with the bleed in or the bleed out, but it is sometimes to experience um, more restrictive situations um, often on, and, and, uh, Janaya's work talks a lot about like uh, vectors of marginalization um, uh, to sort of like feel a sense of emancipation either after um, the game is over to sort of be like, okay, I'm glad the world isn't like this anymore, or to feel empowered in. Um, you know, to have that bleed out of like feeling empowered in, in character and then br- having those feelings of empowerment um, coming on. So yeah, it's, I'll put I'll put I'll put the the spelling of the name in chat, but um, it's very it's very fascinating work. Um, and I I know I have a lot of friends who, you know, for example, oh, yeah. like to really explore historical queerness um, in games uh because um because they like they find that helpful to sort of you know experience you know what it was like to be a lesbian in the victorian era when it was it was really difficult and see these you know these women working it out <laughs> despite <laughs> despite you know everything going on but i think there is also something to be said about like i have also played you know uh, a a straight white man who can just do whatever they want without having to worry about it and and it's kind of nice did he have a butler <laughs> no um it was a D D. <laughs> It was, it was a, it was a revenge character because, you know, I played in the basement with, uh, with a bunch of, um, straight white dudes who would play female characters. Um, and I'd be the only, you know, femme person at the table. And, uh, I was, I, I was not impressed with their, um, (laughs) portrayal of, of women, um, and the characters that they chose to play. So I invented a guy named Guy McMahon. Um, I love it. And he was he was a human fighter, um, and uh, he wanted to do what was manly uh, at all times. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> that was that was Greg. Sometimes he had to do the manly man thing. It was great. Yeah, I was just gonna say it was like weird gendered stereotypes. When I was in uh, grad school, we had to do a lot of role plays, like constant role plays all the time of demonstrating different therapeutic methods and and principles and and whatnot and some people would just get really silly i'll use the word silly uh with their portrayals <laughs> of these characters because obviously they're not playing themselves when you're doing family therapy they have like roles that they're supposed to play and so i messed with everyone's heads one semester and i decided that the role play what we're gonna do i'm gonna choose to not give any pronouns. I'm not going to choose any any name that has a gendered component to it. I'm just going to hand them a neutral character and let's see and it was the most organic role play that we had in all of my grad school career because some people just get these weird notions mm-hmm. of like these ideas. It's strange. It's strange. So sometimes it's fun to have a little power fantasy. 
Um, have any of you seen or heard of the play She Kills Monsters? Yes. Mm-hmm. So um, it's about a girl whose sister dies and she finds her sister's uh, like journal about her Dungeons and Dragons campaign she and her friends have been doing and decides to join the like and play and she learns about her sister uh through this and like her sister's gay like we find out and um it it was that's like that definitely reminded me of of that in that like it's a really cool portrayal of somebody who's like totally like a normal quote unquote whatever you know society decided that means um person crossing over into the like literally so super queer and nerdy weird D and D world and then actually like learning and growing much like Greg did. I was lucky enough to get a chance to see uh that uh mm-hmm. play happen so, five, six years ago. L- long nice. enough now that time is a, a flat circle. Um and what I uh, what I especially loved about that is it's not just the device that gets this sister into the group, but like they then play act out on mm-hmm. the stage. Like here's the D and D session that they're going through and they're being their own characters and everything. And here's and the they're... character in their sexy outfits. Yep. 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 And <laughs> so like, it includes a lot of that kind of uh, tropism and then, and then you cry at the end. <laughs> But it's, yeah, it's a really cool People with souls probably cried at the end, yes. <laughs> well, well, I, I at least uh, did a lot of crying. I can okay. I can say that. But it was, it's a really cool show. and It's, I, it's good. And I think it's something <laughs> that people could watch not knowing anything about Dungeons & Dragons. Like, I think probably a fair number of people who went, especially in the area that I am, that's geeky, geeky central were people who were familiar with Dungeons and Dragons, but because the main character is, doesn't know anything about the game, the audience learns along with her. And so, yeah, this really cool show. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just looking up for it. Apparently during the pandemic, the, uh, um, the playwright wrote a version, um, for like digital spaces so yep. that people could do it like <laughs> online cool. oh that's that's awesome. Awesome. I, I have to go buy a script now and read it <laughs> <laughs> one of the tools that i like to use uh at the end of uh all of our actual play sessions i really like to use the stars and wishes right to kind of naturally and organically build feedback into our culture and i think you were talking, uh, Lauren, about the concept of like a mansatory bleed or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and so to me, I think a tool like that gives the ability to be like, okay, all right, that was my character, right? I am now like me, I'm <laughs> AOC. Like, this is like, okay, this is like a, a, a transition back into the real life. Um, It was interesting. I utilized this with my last panel. So uh, we had some folks on, some advocates uh, for uh, Palestine and talking about the conflict. And we looked at history. And so, like, we ended up together after stream for, like, another hour and a half just, like, doing that process because it was so charged. It was so much going on um, that... You know, I don't know. I find that to be just ritualistically so useful for myself. And I think, you know, maybe, I mean, you can speak to your experience as a player, how vitally important that has been just building our little culture to keep us going. It's It's been a new tool with Frog Pond Academy, having the stars and wishes and having the safety tool deck. And honestly, like having those stars and wishes after game to be able to talk about, okay, what happened? Do you want to see next time? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, Mr. Smith has always done after game. Okay. What direction do you guys want to go in next? Um, But I have had a DM where they don't use any of that. Um, At one point in time, they kind of, I think got sick of my chaotic neutral characters. I tended to play and they handed me a character to play and they said, no, I want you to play this. Um, And it was, they gave me a lawful, good monk who was mute. Mm. 
That's the absolute most horrendous character I've almost. ever heard of. Yeah. I'm I'm really sorry you had to go through that. That Are you uh, okay? A factor was a part of this group at one point in time and this this DM specifically you he was as you said D&D used to be like a like a DM versus player thing. He's he, they are this individual is a very combative with their players kind of dm mm -hmm. and and this was one of the last times i ever had them as a dm i had them one time after that and i'm like nope i, I tried to go back nope. nope some people should just not be allowed to to <laughs> gm like yeah. honestly that's... like and their reasoning for giving me that character was oh you play the same thing every time it's not really that fun for me it's fun for me, it you know. Who cares? It's a fucking game. <laughs> uh, but but I I remember texting oh. and calling Effector like during the game, texting him and then calling him about it after because there was there was some IRL drama also going along with it, and so Effector was the one who said, uh, "I think they're also punishing you for this." Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, not... I think. Having and, and safety tools for that would have been so nice because then I feel like I would have spoken up more. With with Frog Pond Academy, the Stars and Wishes, for example, I feel like I'm able to speak up. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that's important um, to talk about is that safety tools aren't like the be all end all. Like you can't just like have a safety tool. You know, you can't just be like, okay, we're using the X card, we're doing Stars and Wishes, the game is safe now. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, uh, it also it also comes with um, they're they're really their tools and and what you're building is a culture of care at the table where we decide that the people that we are playing with are more important than the game that we are or than the story or the game that we are playing. And that example, like there are so many ways that in a table that you know where tr everybody was on the same page could have said you know hey these characters are making me a little uncomfortable or you know i you, or something like there are so many ways to approach that that are not i'm using my gm power to give you a care you know like and so I'm I'm so I'm so sorry. Like I'm so horrified. I'm I'm so sorry that you had to. Oh, so, like at the time, I was like that. I was looking at the sheet because two of us had to have characters recreated because uh, our characters died the previous session. I had this great character, and she lasted half a session before I had to leave for the night, and somebody else played her for me, and she wound up dying. Oh, uh, no. So you know, I I have never had a DM hand me a sheet. Uh, you know, other than, you know, something consensually ahead of time of, hey, yeah. I'm giving everybody a random character. I have never been handed a sheet being told, nope, this is what I want you to play. Not yeah. what, what I want to play, not something based off something, you know, we've discussed. It's a no, I'm the GM. I want you to be that. Yeah, because I mean, if they're if the GM is not having fun, and I think this is something that's important for GMs to know, um, not this GM, this GM sounds like they suck, but like, if you're a GM listening to this in general, like you're a player too. And so like, you shouldn't feel like you have to capitulate to every player's desire, you know, if you're not going to have a good time with it. Um, and the safety tools are there for you also to sort of, um, discuss about like how things are going so yeah if your players are murder hoboing all of your favorite npcs and not engaging with your the story that you've handcrafted like the safety tools exist to also for you to be like hey i have this thing going that i've worked very hard on is there a way we can make it all work um but but you know like I'm not having fun so with what you're doing. So therefore, you know, I'm going to exert the the power that I have over you to do something that I don't think that you're not gonna have. Like my fun is more important than your fun yeah. is is a bad is a bad vibe. 
Well, and I, I appreciated when you specified that, like, yeah, the safety tools, they're tools, but they're not the end all and be all. Uh, and the idea of, like, they using them and respecting them means everybody just has that culture of understanding the general understanding of like, Hey, we're here to have fun together and we're going to try to not, you know, our characters are going to get angry and we're not going to get angry at each other. Um, because yeah, you end up in situations that both good and bad, that there isn't a specific safety tool for. Um, but having an idea of like, Oh, these are things that can help. Um, yeah. It makes was... conversing with each other easier. I feel like, like with yeah. the, with the tools that we've been using in frog pond Academy, it is easier for me to approach a factor, for example, and be like, Hey, this is what I want to do with a Lorelei or Hey, this part with Doriana hits a little too hard. It's too similar to big bad Barb. Uh, but when when Doriana does embody Big Bad Barb, which is my mom, uh, it, it does make the game a bit more intense and in some ways very fun. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it does make me more comfortable as a player to say to my DM, hey, could we try this? Could I do this? Yeah. And uh, when could I could I become a piss bender? I did. I <laughs> I, I don't know what that you. is, but now I need to know. <laughs> like, I mean, <laughs> it, it, urine is a, a fairly high percentage water. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> no, she literally, she water. Kind of, she literally took the shape water spell at like level oh. four so she could. Yeah. yeah just, that, you know. Makes a lot of sense. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Stick you're... peed on me, so it was my defense to him peeing on me. And if <laughs> nobody put in their consent checklist, no, like... It, you're in play. You're good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Although that would that might be one of those moments where you're in the middle of it and go, I've just I've decided. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nobody's fault. Nobody's fault. I didn't know about that because yeah. Um yeah, that's yeah. The the stars and wishes thing that you're talking about actually uh got to me a little bit because like I love that uh tool conceptually. And in almost all of my games, whether I'm the DM or a player, I've never really been able to make it work the way that I think it's intended to of like, hey, we're going to finish the game and now we're going to sit and have this cool down that this is the what we're going to use. And it's, but what it allowed and continues to allow because that is a tool that we've talked about in all these different games that I've played and because the culture of all of the players at the table is that kind of, you know, we're going to help each other out thing. Okay, the reason that this doesn't, this specific tool doesn't work is because we get to the end of this stream, we get to the end of this game and folks are busy and it's late and folks got to go. You know, this this one's got kids, this one's got a second job, this, you know, whatever the reason. It's really hard once the, the and especially for uh, a bunch of the stream games that I've done and where, like, we all carve out that time, but then it gets to the end and you're like, I, I gotta, I can't stick around. And so being able to recognize that, like, okay, we can't do a Stars and Wishes right after the show because life, because real life and it sucks, but here's the uh the dm uh the group dm that we're all in you know here's the group uh email that people are going to send here's the text message that's going to show up in my phone five minutes after i log off being like hey just kind of checking in uh that that scene we did super intense really cool you okay like just that idea of like this is what i would love to do if we had the time but we don't so let's at least grab the the spirit of it and do it in the way that we can through all the other beans has been really gratifying, especially for those streamed games and where people are busy and we got to run and yeah, being able to text afterwards and be like, all right, now that I have food and a shower, how you doing? <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's something like I'm, I'm beginning to like really enjoy having a cool down after game. Cause back when I was in college, and, and we would be gaming until one, two o'clock in the morning. And, you know, I was working a 6 a.m. barista job back then. Uh, there there was no time to, like, discuss after game. Like, Effector can tell you, we were packing up, like, before game was even really over. 
uh, I can tell you there's a, a handful of times or more than a handful of times where we were doing that um, just because of time constraints and stuff like that. So yeah. um, that's one thing as a DM effector is very good at is carving out the time to, yeah. to have that little bit of cool down. Yeah, have, I'm little a... sessions afterwards with some folks one on one, you know, to be like, hey, like, I just wanted to check in, you know, maybe there's something the whole group doesn't want to hear or need to hear. Like, I'm I always make myself available when I'm running a group. And yeah, oh, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I was I was just gonna say I really do, I think advocate for um, and it's hard it's it's not perfect but when i facilitate games i often try to you know plan for shorter sessions so that we can have you know longer times to do the stars and wishes and you know it doesn't always work sometimes scenes go long and all of that kind of stuff but i do i do think like um especially for for things that are going to go intense um I also really hate cliffhangers. I hate when things end on cliffhangers. They make things really like hard for me to deal with um in in you know the the coming week. And so being able to sort of end a little bit early so that we have a little bit more time off stream or you know out game to sit and talk and we're still you know we're we're still valuing everybody's time is something that uh I'm not great at but <laughs> that I'm trying to get better at uh uh building out when I when I'm facilitating a session to just sort of say okay 20 minutes we're going to talk about what happens and it doesn't necessarily have to be a formal stars and wishes um but but just something to in in the larp world they world um they call it derolling um uh just to yeah pull yourself out of the character that you were and then like you know become yourself again which can be hard and i highly recommend if you are a player in the group you can be that person who facilitates the checking in you don't have to wait for the the gm the dm the storyteller you don't have to they don't have to be the one that is in charge of that. Like yeah. if, if you <laughs> take that off of their plate, <laughs> they're not therapists, uh, but also feel empowered to do it. If you are a player know, but... and that's something that you value. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. And, and also it means that the, the person running the story gets the check-in because all too often you check in on your TMs. Oh my God. Check on, check in on them. <laughs> Especially after a tough, you know, an emotional episode or a really DMs, are you okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just and, like in and, general. <laughs> are you okay? Do you need a cookie? Always. And and I'll I'll say specifically, check in with them when the when you feel as a player like I just steamrolled something, like because the players can often feel real cool and real you know, happy and excited about, we got into this fight with this dragon. We thought it was going to be bad, but we, you know, did all the right stuff and everything went our way. And then we just, everything, it was great. And then afterwards you check in and the DM is just like, yeah, you all had fun. It doesn't say anything. And then you realize later, like, oh, they were kind of hoping for this to be a little bit more epic. Or they were kind of looking forward to getting a chance to use this dragon in this cool way before it got slaughtered. You know, something even as in innocuous as that. So absolutely, uh, if, if you are a player, you don't have to wait for the person in charge of the game to also be in charge of everybody's mental health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because because yeah. talking about that makes me think, oh, I don't really check in that well with either of my DMs outside of game. I mean, it, Mr. Smith, the one in my other campaign, he's pretty vocal after after you know we're ending he's like well i had this plan for you guys but you guys went right around that and he's like you focused on this but i'm here for it and an effector i i think effector is is someone i probably need to check because they'll be well, like can i do this can i do this and back when we used to game at his house every friday i'm pretty sure that there were 
there were some things our group did <laughs> like the like with the Aerochorus and everything oh, if i recall Aerochorus. oh no that was, uh, where that was i think might have been a, 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 ment a bit mentally taxing on him and like looking at it years later because this was this was like four years ago now yeah. Um, pre-pandemic and it's like oh wow we really effed with him on this didn't we and you don't have to feel bad about that realization because the culture of TTRPGs in general and D&D &D in specific is kind of even putting aside the adversarial DM the idea of the DM as the 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 facilitator, the leader, the the person who is in charge of making the game happen. We already know the, the DM is often the person buying the books, making the schedule, coming up with, with everything. And so the kind of, the assumption becomes they're the ones that do the check-in. Um, but yeah, uh, check in with, with your storytellers, especially if they've got to play a really <laughs> slimy, awful character. They've got to be yeah. someone... Mm. You know, if they've given you a Ooh, really yeah, there's awesome some really... person to hate, remember that they had to play that person. That's for... really hard. It's and it's they had to play that hard. person at people that they are friends with, and yeah. that sucks. Yeah, and there and I I've definitely like had that experience where you know um, I was like multiple people's <laughs> terrible parents, and I was saying really awful things, and I was doing awful stuff. And then at the end of the game, you know, the end of the session, people were like, you were so great. I was so <laughs> afraid of you. I was so mad at you. You were so great. I loved it. And I was like, I'm bad. glad. <laughs> like, I'm glad. But like, I also need you to tell me that you still like me and that you're we're still friends. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, I'm glad I did a good job. Um, Another thing I want to add about, you know, checking in on your DMs and checking in on your storytellers is also check in on each other. Um, and if you are a person who um, is good at uh, picking up like nonverbal cues <laughs> around other people, um, maybe just just do a check in, uh, you know, um, to see if other people are feeling, you know, comfortable or uncomfortable. Or if you're not sure, you know, <laughs> call for a break, you know, check in on on a one oh one, send a text message, all of these sort of things just to just to sort of, yeah, share the share the load. Um, I think. I think you know we we put a lot on our on our on our GMs um, uh, that you know especially if they're if if they're like GMing like a a trad game where they have to like have a million other things in their head like you know <laughs> um, we can we can share the load for this but also sometimes the problem may be with the GM or there may be discomfort with the with the GM and so having a little bit of a there's there's a tool in the safety toolkit where it talks about the buddy system of like you know having having a buddy at the table that you can sort of like get in uh you know that you can know that maybe if you don't want to bring something up they're feel a little more comfortable bringing it up for you um all of that kind of stuff just love each other just love your friends just care mm -hmm. for them yep. Um, and, and, and I'll yeah. go ahead. Sorry. No, I'll speak from experience of the if you check in with someone because maybe you it was an intense scene or maybe you thought you read something that like, oh, are they worried about this? And they're absolutely fine and everything's great. It, it's not like you've done anything wrong. You check in with somebody and be like, hey, I just want to make sure you're OK. That's always going to go well. It, because no one is ever upset that you've checked in on them. You know, people have checked in on me and been like, are, are you okay? You seemed really upset and I'm perfectly fine. And then it makes me feel good. Not just because, oh, my friend cares, but hey, maybe my acting was real good that session. <laughs> that was all right. Okay, cool. So yeah, don't, don't ever feel like, oh, if I misread this, this is going to be bad. Caring about someone is never bad. <laughs> Along those lines, I think something really important is that because, like, I, I like I mentioned, do play in a group of people where we're all trying to be funny and have fun, and 
because of that, I think it's so easy to get lost in. Yay, everyone had such a great time tonight. We all loved it and everyone was laughing and it was so much fun. Nothing could possibly be wrong and everyone's too, totally like perfectly fine moving on. And it's so important to like look at situations and be like, hey, yeah, we did have fun. But you know what? We also were still doing something that takes stuff out of us. And like it takes a certain there's a very specific type of energy needed to play these games at all. And um, just that alone can be um, not necessarily harmful to your like health, mental health or like of any kind, but but not necessarily helping. And it's just really easy to forget that even though it is fun, it's also real. And being funny is hard. Being funny is, is stressful and hard and just as as especially when it's a table of people all trying to be funnier than the other ones. Oh no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then the DM just wants to murder all of you um because you've moved 4 feet in the last 2 hours. Mm -hmm. And forgive me for if I got the neuroscience wrong here, but I'm fairly certain that they have done studies where like the emotions you experience when you're acting um and the physical like physicality like your brain doesn't necessarily know the difference mm -hmm. you know yep. <laughs> between between what you're do like what is real and what is not real especially when it comes to like the physical effect like the physical effects of um of stress you know and so it's it is it is really important to like yeah is that even if you're having fun you're you're still you're still feeling you know the the tear <laughs> there's no such thing as real like if you're fake crying you're still actually crying and you're still gonna feel the effects of crying after the motivation's just a little different yeah, yeah. yeah. Huh. That's why people yeah. say, you know, if you're sad, just try smiling and laughing and your body's yeah. like, oh, why do I feel better? Or the thing that they did about like the putting the pencil like yep. under your nose. or Oh, that's hilarious. Teeth. Yeah, they did like a whole, <laughs> they did like a whole, like real scientists did a real scientific study where they had Good. people like hold the pencil like this and then they had to hold them between their teeth and like the people who who held it between their nose and their lips left feeling like grumpy like they had wasted a whole bunch of time yeah. and the people who held it in between their teeth thought it was really funny and like had a much happier outlook because they were like smiling as opposed to frowning yeah there's for sure That's... research that how smiling has a big impact on your mood it's it's real science. oh yeah <laughs> That's it's, it's wonderful science yeah, it's one of the reasons why when people talk about an experience they had in a game uh, as like, <laughs> this is what happened five minutes ago, five years ago, whatever, they mostly talk about it in first person. Uh, hey, I remember this time that I killed this dragon. I remember this time I was with this group of people who we were playing a game and we mm -hmm. got into a scuffle and we did a thing. It's because your brain forms those memories as though you were actually doing the thing. And so it it becomes a natural, no, no one ever really questions when it's like, oh yeah, so we were playing this game the other day and I picked up this shovel and this, and, and you're saying I, 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 and it's because it was you, you, you. You might have been playing a character, but it was you, you, you. For anyone like me whose brain didn't quite get the wording there, this was as opposed to saying my character did this. Thank you. That's yeah. No, I, I took me way that, too yeah. long. I was like, what, what else would we say other than I <laughs> like we? Yeah. yeah. And, and that's and, actually, Oh, sorry. I was just, I was just saying, thank you for bringing that up. Cause I should, <laughs> I should have given that comparison because yeah, <laughs> that's what happens. That's actually a good, the reverse is a very good tip um, for mitigating bleed sometimes mm -hmm. is that if things are feeling really close um and you usually narrate in first person um you know then just switching to narrating in third person can mm -hmm. be really helpful um because just that little bit of verbal distance so if you you know say like 
I look into your eyes and say, and hold your hands and I say, I love you. That's, you know. (laughs) 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 It's okay, I'm sorry. (laughs) Trauma Um, response. (laughs) um, That is a very intimate moment and it could be you know you're just role playing but it yeah it could be very uncomfortable or you may not want to go there in yourself so saying you know stardust looks into moonshine's eyes and holds their hands and says i love you then you're you know just that all of a sudden you don't have the like oh I don't know how I feel about this. Like, oh, this is weird to me. Just that little bit of distance can be helpful. So in the spirit of, Lauren, what you said, creating a culture of caring at your table, which is the purpose here of, you know, implementing these kinds of tools. Um, is there a tool that anyone in the group particularly enjoys that we haven't brought up? So far in our discussion or and it doesn't have to be an official safety tool it can be just something that you've created as a practice when you're playing or uh, facilitating something that you find really helpful i've got a google spreadsheet that was given to me by a a good friend several years ago um because i was looking for a way to do the whole session zero you know at least a basic safety lines and veils for one shots in where you're not necessarily going to be able to get together with those people ahead of time. Uh, Everything is going to be kind of over emails or over whatever, and then we're going to go ahead and play. And it, the spreadsheet, basically what you do is uh, you just copy it for every group that you have, and then uh, you send it to the group. And it's, it's basically I'll, a list of here's a whole bunch of content. Um, tell me, you know, on this scale of absolutely everything is okay. Ah, eh, let's be a little careful of this. No, I don't want this at all. Where you fall on these, and if there's anything that's missing, you can go ahead and write at the bottom. And what's amazing about it, which I I I, <laughs> I wish I'd even thought about this ahead of time until I saw this spreadsheet, because it's a Google spreadsheet, it's anonymous all you're doing is putting X's and things. All you're doing is writing things. You don't put your name anywhere, you know, because a lot of the time people were filling out forms and then the DM was getting that all and having to collate. But because the spreadsheet, everybody's actions on it are anonymous, including the DMs, it becomes a resource that everyone can access that it's, it's almost like a living document in a way. Yeah. And so what, what was great about it was not just, okay, here's a really easy way to get these lines and veils before this one shot where we're not going to be able to talk to each other. It also means everybody could go look at it and not feel like they're stepping on other people's toes because they're not, they don't know, you know, so-and-so is afraid of spiders. They just know, oh, somebody put down no spiders. So my druid isn't going to turn into a spider. Um, And it's something that then if you're doing a stream and you've got a producer, you can give to the producer and they can put in that. And so like the idea of being able to get at least that basic information in a way that everyone can access without anyone feeling like they need to say anything personal about anything is, is something that I really enjoy. And there's, I think there's a bunch of them floating out there now um, but yeah, just, just putting together a Google spreadsheet and I just, ha- I just have the blank one with just the basics and no X's. And every time I'm going to run a game, uh, I just copy it and it just goes out to just those people. And then I delete it once it's done. And, oh, it's so good. I love that. I love that. That's similar There's to a... like the survey that a factor gave us before we started, um, Frog Pound Academy, but I'm not sure how anonymous right from the it is. safety tool toolkit. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say there's a version of the uh, um, it's it's not quite the same as the Monty Cook uh, consent checklist, but it is yeah. a version of the consent checklist that I made in Google Forms because I just I don't know I just hyper fixated one day and was like I'm gonna do this. Um, 
and also if you use online character keepers, Google Sheets is a really good, uh, a lot of them exist in Google Sheets and it's it's really easy to just add a lines and veils page um, mm -hmm. to it. But yeah, the, that is one of the greatest things about online play is that you can make it, uh, you can make it anonymous in a way that is uh, easy and also like um, anonymous, like for everybody, also for the DM, um, yeah. which is great, especially for you know stranger games. <laughs> and if if you're playing mm -hmm. with if if you're playing with strangers and you don't necessarily want this DM you've just met for the first time to learn, you know all of your triggers <laughs> and it's it's great not just for one shots but like longer campaigns because it, as i ran a uh it was a 12 episode game and we were using the spreadsheet and we had multiple guests coming in and out mm -hmm. and we had a producer mm -hmm. and all of it so basically i i had told everybody as part of our pre-show before we go live i'm just going to remind everybody to check the google spreadsheet in case there's been an update and then I don't have to worry. No one has to come to me and say there's an update. I don't have to constantly be checking it. I just it just turns into, <laughs> hey, take the 15 seconds before we go live, pull up the spreadsheet, see if there's anything on there that has changed, add things if you need to. But like it just became such a, a an easy anonymous resource. So and yeah, there's the, something. The, go ahead. You finish what your sentence. I, I... No, I was just going to say the Monty Cook checklist is great to pull from yeah. for that list. Yeah. Um, I like, I like, I really like the idea of the anonymous like document that, you know, so you don't have to uh, be embarrassed about anything or, or judge, feel like you're going to be judged or anything. But there's also something to be said about just like being able to play with people where you can just have open conversations and genuinely just go, hey, these are my no's. And everyone's like, yeah, oh, I agree or whatever. And that kind of game can be so special because you don't have to think about the being judged, the the being people thinking you're weird or trying to keep things, you know, anonymous, finding a way to keep things secret or whatever. Um, that's a com it's a completely different kind of game that you're playing, like ultimately. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have I have friends that I play with and when we do lines and veils, we usually like we don't even do we're just like the usual because we're just <laughs> <usual>. so <laughs> we're so familiar with um what we need and we also know that we can like bring it up in uh in later on or if things change or any of that kind of stuff. Um I don't have a favorite safety tool because I can't choose. <laughs> Well, and that's the beauty of your toolkit is like it is it is a toolkit and some games, some of those are going to work better than others. And some yeah. sometimes, you know, one shots are you're going to use this set and sometimes for longer campaigns, you use this set and sometimes in the middle of a campaign, you decide this works for that. They're all good, but they're all, you know, a hammer is no better or worse than a screwdriver, but sometimes you need a hammer and sometimes you need a screwdriver. I'm like in my brain judging like the pros and cons of hammers versus screwdrivers. And honestly, I think that like hammers are better because you can put a screw in with a hammer, but you can't put a nail in with a screwdriver. This is how my brain works, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's wrong. It's yeah, so wrong. <laughs> like scientifically, maybe maybe a, a hammer yeah. is better. <laughs> Until yeah. you want to get that screw out. No, the hammer, the back of the thing. You just have to dig it into the wall a little bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just means there might be a little bit of damage just, to it. You might not you get, get your deposit down. back, but oh, you no. know, were you anyway? <laughs> This well, is, actually, this that's the version of the safety tool in where yeah. someone in the middle of the game hit something that was a that was a line that they didn't know that they had, and yeah. so now the hammer needs to be used for the screwdriver. Smack! <laughs> yeah, actually, the, this this hammer screwdriver thing is is something that I use in my education work to talk about. Um, uh, sometimes safety tools don't work for people. Um, a really famous example is like the X card versus the Lexton technique. Um, and so basically, uh, the X card, uh, is sometimes doesn't work for people who have very strong trauma reactions because in fact, um, 
pretending something never happened uh, can make it worse. Mm. And so um, this is the Lexton technique. It's uh, it's an essay by um, a writer and game designer named PH Lee, who was talking about an experience that they had at uh, with a GM at a at a convention um, where if something happened instead of pretending it never happened, like if a trigger was hit, instead of pretending never happened, they stop, they figure out what the triggered person needs to happen next. And they get that um, control to sort of, uh, they mm -hmm. get the narrative control to say what is going to happen next so that they feel good about, about all of that. Um, and I think, yeah, it's a really good example of like, sometimes a tool isn't going to work for people. So that's why, you know, like you, what, you can't just say, oh, we're going to use the X card. Um, uh, because maybe the X card doesn't work for somebody. So I really encourage people to, you know, to actually talk about the sort of safety tools that they're comfortable using. There are some safety tools I don't feel comfortable using at, uh, at tables and, and some safety tools I know other people feel uh, that don't feel comfortable using. And so, so if you are starting a game, um, I really recommend that you approach safety tool choice as a discussion. And you say, um, like if you're a GM or a facilitator, these are the tools I would like to use. Can we is make that, that anonymous okay Google Doc about what <laughs> tools you want to use or not? Um, is that okay? Or is there something that we need to add? Because, yeah, I mean, you can open a box with a hammer. But if you open the box with the screwdriver, then maybe the box will be more intact. You know? I mean, it exactly. depends on the kind of box. And that's the whole point. Yeah. Yeah. If it's a shoebox, you're taking it a little too far and you should just fucking open it with your hands. <laughs> just use your fingers. <laughs> it's not that hard. <laughs> so I, I want to be respectful of uh, our guest times. We've been together for a couple of hours. So if, if there's any other last minute, like I got to get it out there, I got to share this, please let me know. Otherwise, maybe we can move towards wrapping our stream up. Um, so, yeah, thank can you. I just say one little note? Go ahead, go ahead. I jotted down at work today just something that I think a lot of people don't uh consider like because you know we are we have been talking about a safety tool and a safety tool kit being relatively new in its like defined sense versus like a loose hey whatever we might have some things we should do that it's so different for playing a game with your friends at home and actual play because the biggest thing that I think people don't consider when putting it into effect for actual play is that content going online is going to be online forever. And what you are agreeing to now is not going to be, it's not going to be like the be all end all for this because you're going to see that video on YouTube in 10 years and you're going to go shit. Hmm. So that's, I just feel that's something like the fact that it's, it's not just a memory that we all have of sitting around a table, but I can literally go view what we did is something that really needs to be considered when, when looking into toolkit and tools that you're going to use for actual play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hundred percent agree. And, and like the difference in, in actual play versus home play is, is its own uh, discussion that I think we could all talk about for another two hours. But yeah, that is, it's an incredibly good point because mm -hmm. yeah, the, sometimes the internet is ephemeral and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's not as ephemeral as we'd like. Yeah. And nope. sometimes you're on the morning news the next day and you don't know why. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. All, so. Uh, Maddie, is I that wonder, a personal experience? I don't know what had? you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't. Excuse me, I checked on the safety consent list that I don't want to talk about this. <laughs> I'll black. say, yeah, just, yeah, just we're done. <laughs> yeah, we're done. Uh, I'll give a positive example of that. Um, I was playing a game online that was a long running campaign with very good friends that I'd uh, that I was playing in, and 
Um, and it was a longer game. Like we were, we were playing for several hours and it was weekly and so much fun and everything, but it was definitely a game that had uh, darker undertones. There were serious things mm -hmm. going on. Everybody had lines and veils. Everybody was checking in. It was great. We hit during the game something that I had never put on my lines and veils. I had never thought was an issue. And then as soon as, and we didn't even, it didn't even really happen in the game. It was the moment of, oh crap, this might be happening. What and was I, it? I have to know. Um, in roundabout ways, uh, a character was depressed and there was a non-zero chance that they were going to uh, take that to an unfortunate conclusion. And I didn't realize that that was a thing that I absolutely did not want oh, yeah. until that moment. <laughs> now we had all the stuff, you know, like in the positive sense, like I went to our backstage chat and was checking in and got the immediate, no, 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 promise that's not going to happen. And so everything's mm -hmm. okay. And then we talked about it during the break and like all, hey, safety tools worked. Yay. It's a little hard for me to go and watch that episode because. Mm -hmm. I can see it on my face and I can remember mm -hmm. that moment. Mm -hmm. And so even though it didn't happen in the game, even though everything was fine, even though it was a, a fine outcome and now, Hey, I learned something new about myself. That is a show. I don't, I can't watch. I can't go back and look at. Yeah, there's definitely, and it's something I've been thinking about a lot um, since my, my, my days in actual play when I was, <laughs> we don't speak of those anymore, but, <laughs> uh, but, but just that there is, you know, like there's no way to, well, there is a way to retcon, but like, how do you retcon something when other people, you know, when it's just on the internet for people that you say, Oh, that never happened. And then there's evidence that, Oh, it did happen. Or how do you deal with it when like, you're retconning something and you have a big fan base and maybe the fan base is like, I don't like that you did that. So I'm going to pretend that it all, you know, that it, that it happened in all of my fan fiction. And like, how do you deal with just that, you know? Um, I think all GMs need <laughs> a wizard NPC who does the men in black memory eraser. <laughs> memory eraser, That's yeah. at their disposal. They just, oh my God, so weird. So these guys in black suits just start walking down the street and they come up to you with this weird device and a yeah. light flashes in your face and suddenly it's that morning again. You have no idea. Mm -hmm. That Done. would be a nice tool to kind of reset in a way. Mm -hmm. it, depending you know like on on your campaign and your group of course you can make um, it make sense somehow I i'm sure recently yeah. introduce a time witch to the campaign so you did and i'm gonna fuck her up real good pardon my french the poor <laughs> time witch, she did nothing <laughs> well uh, and and just like how the toolkit there's a whole bunch of tools because not everyone is good for every group or every situation not every group will want to deal with that situation the same way if you know a light-hearted group versus a serious group uh might deal with it in it might be easier for the light-hearted group to just be like ah it didn't happen let's just rewind that while the serious group may need to take a little bit more mm -hmm. time and and deal with it it might be something you know like lauren was talking about about just some players need to handle things in certain ways so yeah it's to turn it, it into like a full journey that the story goes like to heal from this thing that accidentally came up yep i i think ever since being introduced to safety tools through frog <laughs> pond academy i don't think i'm ever going to be able to participate in another game without those because like i said that that lovely dm who told me what character to play they're wanting to start another campaign and like awesome. i can't do that without boundaries i can't do that without some kind of safety net to know okay my triggers aren't going to get touched because this person was the kind of person that likes to push the envelope um yeah. effector i don't know how much you would want me to elaborate on that or if you want to weigh in on that person at all because we were... already hate them it yeah. doesn't matter <laughs> <We're good to laughs> <decide>. yeah <laughs> but i i think even even if i dm again i'm gonna have some kind of safety boundary tool in place so i as a dm know how far I can go and what my players are expecting and what. 
You should run a campaign where everybody is a mute monk. It's a good idea. It is a good it idea. Because, because, like, it's I'm a very chatty person, and sitting there with this character, not knowing how I'm going to speak, and of course, I'm I'm you know lawful good or whatever, and I'm no, like, you're not gonna do anything bad. To I I'm chaotic <laughs> neutral, like most of the time, and I'm like, Ugh. and the the extra sad thing is. That's not necessarily a bad character. Like, if you, you can sign make up it, for that. If yeah. you wrote that as a character, that'd be dope. Yeah, if you, all the players were on board, like, yeah. there are plenty of ways to make that not only work, but be super cool and evocative and everything, but to be thrown that, that As is, an insult. Yeah, yeah. But as a compliment, Emmy, um, your ability to throw in catch words, hmm, mwah. What I've learned from using the safety toolkit in Frog Pond Academy, I'm just like, okay, do you, are, are you like consider commercial work? I think you'd be perfect. <laughs> without like, without skipping a beat, every single just mm -mm, love it. Funny. Thank That's funny. you. Agreed. All right. This uh, message has been brought to you by Effector of Change in the Frog Pond Academy. This is true. See? <laughs> Live Fired. every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's facts. Facts. It All gets right. better. He's made me do the Final Fantasy 14 copy pasta enough times. I've got it commercial voice down. I'm not even sponsored. Good skill I to just have. Love it. Listen, as someone who has to do a modicum of, of voiceover and voice acting, it's a really good skill to have. All right, let's go around the room then. Thank you everybody for joining and having this conversation with me. I feel like I learned a lot. I hope you all are taking something away. Hi, kitty. Hi, baby. Baby. Yeah, yeah thank you for, for just having your cat. I, I've, yeah. I've noticed it every time Ooh. and I've been delighted. You know, <laughs> he, um, this is Rizzo for anyone who doesn't know Rizzo. Oh, Kitty, this is Lee. Look at them both. I just woke him up, so he's still sleeping. My other one is hiding behind my accordion on my bed. This, this <laughs> is the safety tool that everybody always loves. It is, it is Kitties. post chat pet. Yep. yep. Oh, cat, dog, bird, bring it's them all on. I, want, I always want to see your pet on stream. He just, this one just curls up, and he oh. likes booty pets for whatever reason. I, mean, I don't get it. Same. Uh, yeah, so let's go around the room uh, and let us know where we can find you and the work that you're doing. Uh, we'll start at the top with Emmy. Uh, so you can find me live here on Twitch four to five days a week, sometimes on a Factors channel, sometimes on my own. Sometimes Link uh, even comes on there as Cat Tax, where you can redeem I bring Link or his sister Zelda live on stream. <laughs> They get snuggles and they get pet pets. Um, I, I, you know, I'm here. I stream JRPGs and spoopy games and overall, as I say it, whatever the hell I want, I embrace my chaos. And that's what Twitch has taught me to do. Um, sometimes you'll see me on, you know, modding for a factor or plunge 87 or squid monarchy. And then a lot of the time you see me telling people to follow obsessive repulsive because that man deserves follows. <laughs> Please consider supporting him today uh i do go live on tiktok from time to time not often though um just because tiktok is a little uh different it's a little unhinged over there still <laughs> i feel the moderation here. system is special yeah um but yeah that's that's where you can find me most days of the week um i i can't think of anything else you want awesome. me to add there I, I just, I like to play games and I like to make friends and that's why I came to Twitch. Ranky, uh, what about you? Moving over to uh, Ovalor and where can we First find off, you? Thanks for having me on. This was super fun. Y'all were amazing to chat with and it was, it was great to chat with you. Um, and I am Lauren Urban. You can find me, go to my website, lauren-urban.com. It's kind of the easiest way. And that way, if there's, a, if I'm on a social, I've got it linked right on the front page. If I'm excited about a thing, it's right on the front page. I'm mostly Twitter and blue sky. Um, the other place you can find me is over at Idol Champions of the Forgotten Realms, where I make pretty much all of the content that you can see and or hear and or read. So if you see a video or read a blog or come to the Twitch channel, part of that I have done. And so, uh, yeah, come on by and t tell, tell me if you like things because 
just like players and GMs, anyone who creates things really wants that kind of feedback all the time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, this has been a lot of fun. And uh, I look forward to everybody having a much safer time at their tables. And Lauren? Yeah, my name is Lauren Bryant Monk. I'm the co curator of the TTRPG Safety Toolkit. Um, I also uh, work as a, a safety tool writer and a safety consultant um, and game designer. You can find my games on itch.io. Um, and you can find uh, all of the information about the, the work that I do um, on my website, starvingsubret.com. Um, yeah, uh, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna shout out the games that I have recently written for, which are Starforged and, uh, Die. Um, uh, Kian and I both wrote, uh, or worked together to write the safety tools for both of those games. And, uh, I'm very proud of the work we did. They're really good. So, uh, definitely check those games out. And Maddie? Uh, I'm Maddie and uh, minimalgameplay.com. I, I, any, anything you can think of, I've dabbled in it at some uh, venture. Uh, most importantly, obviously, please check out my uh, dating sim game on itch.io. Uh, it is, uh, if you watch the Bachelorette season with Gabby and Rachel as the Bachelorettes, and you were upset that they didn't end up together. Uh, don't worry about it because you can just go play my dating sim and they end up together in four different ways. Choices matter. So, and you can find me on my own stream more often than, than anywhere else. And then perception studio. Uh, and if you like puppeteering, which, uh, if you don't know, if you like puppeteering, Figure that out for your your own consent and uh, and stuff checklist because some people really don't. I've learned, um, but puppets they're funny. It's always a good time at Perception Studio. It is. Thank you oh. for for having us. Uh, You're effector. welcome. Yeah, thank you for hosting this so and much. opening up this for discussion. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, this was a good thank time. You all. All right, y'all. Thank hi, you hi, for joining. If I roll Thank you. Audience, we'll see you next month. Uh, probably live at PAX because we're going to be in Boston. So Fun. That's right. Okay. PAX is next month. That's all right. Bye, y'all. Bye. bye. Link, say bye. Say bye. Thank you all for joining for another episode of Roll for Resilience. As I like to say, with the right conditions, every single human being has the ability to heal and you have the power to create those conditions. Again, I'm Effector of Change. You can find me streaming on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Effector of Change. We live record episodes of the Frog Pond Academy, our actual play 5e campaign, every Wednesday at 8.30 Eastern on the Twitch channel. If you'd like to support my work, you can donate to my Ko-Fi at ko-fi.com slash Effector of Change.